Earlier this year, I set out to build my most advanced model rocket yet, using different types of hardware, programming, and using an entirely different recovery system deployment method. I bought an Arduino, an SD card module, a servo motor, a bunch of wires to stick it all together, learnt an entirely new programming language, bought a 3D printer, printed a massive thing can that took 42 hours, put it all together, and here we are. In this video, I'm going to go over the lead up to the launch, the flight itself, and the aftermath. My name is George, and my latest model rocket, Velox E, is one I've been developing since February of this year, and it's been a huge undertaking ever since. Everything leading up to this flight has been documented in three previous videos on this channel if you're interested. You can also just skip to the launch itself if you really want to, but if you're still here, let's first go over everything that happened since the previous video right up to launch. Originally, I planned to launch only a couple days after the latest video had been published. However, the reason it's been so long is because the motors that I had ordered in June arrived in August nearly 50 days later. This is just another example of how difficult it is to get motorists to Ireland, so they really need to do something about that. Anyway, as soon as they eventually arrived, I immediately plugged the motors with definitely a good amount of epoxy, and began some final checks with the rocket software. It was on the very same day we were scheduled to launch, did I notice something was off. The servo motor had a habit of just not rotating sometimes and I would physically have to push it in order to do so. I tried many things, such as swapping the wires and the battery, and even changing some of the codes only a few hours before liftoff, but I couldn't figure it out. My best guess was that the servo motor was just malfunctioning internally, and I didn't have the time or the resources to fix it myself, so we just went ahead with the launch anyway. Look, it was delayed enough, okay? There's many ways you could fix this for the many possible problems it could have, such as giving it a direct connection to the battery instead of going through the Arduino, or just buying a more powerful servo motor. We then returned to the wind farm, surprisingly, given the problems we had last year. The quarry, the location we launched Falcon Bobby 2.0 at, was good and all, but since recovering the rocket this time was top priority in order to retrieve the flight data, those large bodies of water and tall trees were too much of a hazard. The wind farm was much more open, so we positioned ourselves as far from the turbines as possible before proceeding with the launch. Three, two, one. <laughs> Some of you eagle-eyed viewers may be able to point out that the parachute didn't deploy again. In fact, the servo motor didn't rotate at all, as we can see from the onboard camera. This was kind of expected, however, and as I mentioned previously, there could be a number of reasons for this. Something else that occurred midway in the launch was one of the ejection charges actually managed to escape through the epoxy, blowing the whole motor out of the back, and all the epoxy straight up through the airframe like a bullet ripping a hole through the bottom of the payload bay. Keep in mind, right above this were all the electronics. This cap came literally a few millimeters away from probably destroying the Arduino and the SD module with all the flight data on it. The fact that they still turn on after this is basically a miracle. In fact, when the top of the payload bay broke off in the last video, it might have just saved the electronics, because I feel like the epoxy would have just hit the top of the payload bay and ricocheted back to hit the Arduino. So I'm Glad I didn't bother putting that back on. There's actually a scorch mark on the bottom of the breadboard, so I assume the cap must have hit that instead of the electronics directly. On the tracking footage, you can see two plumes of smoke coming from the back of the rocket, along with two popping sounds. Where that second pop came from, I'm not entirely sure, since only one of the motor's caps blew off. Also, you can just about make out either the motor or the door in the side of the airframe flying in the air, and you can also see it in the frame of the onboard footage. The door that I used to access the electronics was only sealed with some duct tape, so it's no surprise the ejection charge blew it off. After we found the rocket again, it was buried even deeper into the ground than Falcon Bobby was. <laughs> One of the motors came out, look. Oh, wow. After pulling it up, only the airframe came out. The entire nose cone, along with the parachute and servo motor, were completely buried nearly a meter into the ground. And there was no way in hell I was digging that out. The camera case was filled with a bunch of wet mud, but thankfully I managed to pull the camera itself out and was able to turn it on. And the SD cards with all the footage on it was slightly caked in mud, but it was still in one piece. So here's the battery. The uh, 3D printed case where it came off completely. 
these are the wires connecting the servo motor they've disconnected obviously because it's in the ground <laughs> the breadboard is halfway up the body when I looked inside the airframe, I was surprised to actually see an LED on the Arduino was still on. After a cap of epoxy travelling at the speed of a bullet narrowly missed it, and survived an impact at nearly 100 meters per second, the Arduino was still working and connected to the battery, which, mind you, was placed near the top of the rocket. Back home, I managed to get the electronics out and crucially retrieve the SD card with all the flight data on it. Everything was surprisingly still intact. The Arduino itself was slightly disconnected from the breadboard, and that was about it. It still turned on and looks ready to fly again. I stuck the SD card into my computer, and after messing with the data a little, I put everything onto a graph. This is the rocket's vertical acceleration in Gs over time in milliseconds. I know, don't get too excited. In all seriousness, this is actually really cool. It's the only proper flight data I've ever been able to gather from a launch, and it tells us a couple things. First, I'll play it over the launch footage. No. Keep in mind during this that the rocket's idle state is actually 1, not 0, since we're measuring its acceleration in Gs, which is multiples of gravity, so when you're not moving you experience 1 times the force of gravity. Firstly, we see that when all the motors ignite, the rocket quickly accelerates to exactly 4 times the force of gravity for about 300 milliseconds before it drops again to about 3.25 for another 300 milliseconds. The reason the thrust curve isn't completely flat is because of increased drag on the rocket during flight and changes to the way the rocket propellant burns. Once the motors burn out entirely, however, it instantly begins to slow down, dropping below the idle state of 1. Soon after, however, you'll see two large spikes in acceleration. This is actually when the ejection charge escapes from one of the motors. Again, you will see two spikes here, and we saw earlier two plumes of smoke and two popping sounds. If anyone has any ideas where that second force came from, please let me know because I don't know. After it stabilized, it continued slowing down before reaching apogee, right about four and a half seconds into flight. The reason the accelerometer is reading zero G is because the rocket is actually in freefall at this point and experiences zero gravity. In fact, it teeters around zero even when it's falling down. This is because the accelerometer measures proper acceleration, not coordinate acceleration. The main difference is who the observer is. To our eyes, when the rocket is falling, it's gaining speed and therefore experiencing acceleration. However, the rocket and the accelerometer doesn't feel acceleration because it's in freefall. The accelerometer measures acceleration based on the forces acting directly on it, not relative to the ground. This is actually something I didn't consider when designing the rocket, so it's interesting to see how the accelerometer experienced everything. When the rocket crashed, the program detected touchdown and stopped recording recording any data. Either that or something disconnected. <laughs> so there you go, that was my first piece of real flight data from a model rocket launch and it was very interesting to look through it. In future, I don't plan to try and use any servo actuated recovery system again. It's no more reliable or any less complex than just using pyrotechnics. It was mainly just to try something different this time, and the main goal here was to gather flight data. In total, the rocket reached an apogee of roughly 470 meters, a peak velocity of around 60 meters per second, and impacted the ground at nearly 100 meters per second, which is very fast. This was a very fun and interesting project, and I learned a lot about programming and microcontrollers and a bunch of other stuff. In terms of what's next, I'm just not sure really. I've got a very busy few months ahead of me, and I doubt I'll find the time to get back into making rockets anytime soon, but you never know. I have some ideas of what I want to do in the future, including a two-stage rocket, which would be interesting, and experimenting with a few other recovery systems. Before I leave, I just want to thank all of you guys for watching this video and following along with this project as a whole. It's been very interesting, it's been very fun. Thank you very much for watching, and may your skies be blue, and... what was it? May your skies be blue and your may your skies be blue and your rockets be big I think <laughs>